And that's what makes the message of Christmas classic. Uh, that we have a Savior who came down for us. As we gather today, we, we wrap up, we have a plus one to our classic Christmas series, and I pray you are blessed as we dig into Matthew chapter 2. Uh, so I want you to think back about this last week in your Christmas celebrations. Uh, first, I want you to think about what made it classic. Uh, what part of your celebration made it special, made it unique, was filled with tradition, and, and one year from now, or five years from now, or ten years from now, will be that thing that you remember when you see that picture. Uh, was it the gathering that you had, the, the food that that you enjoyed? Was it the people that you were with? And what made it classic? Because I'm guessing there was something or some things that it will stand out in your mind and, and you'll carry with you. And, and as you think about that, I also want you to think about the other side of the coin. Uh, what this year was maybe missing or, or different uh, that's been a part of your Christmas celebrations for, for many years gone by that caused you to say it just didn't feel right. Uh, what was missing should have been a part of our Christmas. It's what made it classic for the years that have gone by. If your family is, is, is like mine, there, there's probably something that you've already even discussed that, that wasn't there or wasn't quite the same. On Christmas Day, our uh, family, myself, my wife, and Noah, uh, joined my father-in-law and some friends at the Chinese restaurant down the road after Christmas services. That's part of our tradition. There's some awesome food at that place called Bamboo. If you're looking for a place on Christmas Day, they're open at 11 o'clock. Um, but when we were discussing Christmas, my father-in-law said, I, I, I think I put my finger on what has made this Christmas a little different. Because this is going to be the first Christmas that, that I don't celebrate it with my siblings. Uh, for many years after his mom had moved to Michigan, all the siblings from Michigan, Wisconsin would, would still gather and celebrate Christmas with, with their mom. And even some of the grandkids would come. And, and when his mom passed away, the, the siblings still would gather kind of in honor of her. They would do the same kind of food that they had when, when mom cooked it, oyster stew and creamy herring. I know that doesn't sound very classic or good, but that's what they did. And that was memorable. But they decided this year they weren't going to do it anymore. And, and, and he put his finger on it and said, it, it just doesn't seem right. And, and maybe you've had one of those Christmases too. Something was missing. There, there wasn't something there. Uh, there wasn't someone with you because they're, they're no longer here. There, there was a favorite food that you didn't get to enjoy. I don't know what it is, but we can relate when there's something classic that, that doesn't feel just complete. And that's why today we're going to look at the story of the wise men. I know it wasn't a part of Luke's classic Christmas chapter 2. Uh, I'm going to tell you something that, that you maybe haven't heard before or aren't quite sure of. It, it wasn't actually a part of the Christmas story. Uh, the wise men who we're going to talk about today did not arrive on the scene to see newborn baby Jesus wrapped in cloth laying in a manger. No, they, they showed up to, to Bethlehem, to a house, and toddler Jesus, maybe even up to two years old Jesus. And sorry, parents, Jesus didn't have the terrible twos like all of your kids did because um, he was perfect and he was holy. But, but somewhere in that range of one to two is most likely the age of Jesus when, when this takes place. So it isn't Christmas and a part of the angels, shepherds, and all those things. But I believe there's a Christmas truth that we can take away that might make your celebration of a classic Christmas complete. And I also believe it's a great truth that can encourage us as we look back at a year gone by and look forward to a year to come and take with us. So if there's something that has missed, that, that's been missing, I pray that the story of the wise men wise men brings together uh, a classic Christmas truth that, that is a beautiful gift to you today. It's where our story begins in in Matthew chapter 2. So Matthew was the other account that records Jesus' birth. Matthew's account is a little different. He tells us about Joseph and an angel appearing to him and saying, take Mary to be your wife, name this baby Jesus. And the last sentence of, of, Luke, uh, of Matthew chapter 1 is, and, and Jesus was born and he named him Jesus, period. And that's where chapter 2 kicks in. Not how long has passed, but, but the focus shifts to individuals who weren't anything to do with that that first night of Jesus' arrival on earth. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star 
when it rose and we have come to worship him. Now, if you've ever heard the story of the wise men in, in Matthew chapter 2, the first thing that most Christians try and figure out and, and, and have uh, the desire to, to, to know is all about the star and these men from the east and, and everything that's a part of this story. But here's what we don't know. We don't know if this was a special once-in-a-lifetime star that, that God caused to be in the sky the day Jesus was born or if it was a once-in-every-450-year star anomaly that was a special indicator that, that Jesus was born. It, we don't know if it was just a star that was up there that God caused to shine a little bit brighter and a little bit better. We just know that God did what God promised and, and there was a star. And for some crazy reason, these non-Jewish individuals were waiting for it. <laughs> Wise men from the east. Uh, now, our best assumption is the east means like maybe Babylon, one of those places where God's people had gone to in captivity 700, 600 years earlier kind of locations. Uh, Magi was a, t a name for these, these men who were very learned, knowledgeable individuals, high up uh, in, in the kingdom, powerful, influential people. Uh, a man named Daniel, if you've ever read the Old Testament book, Daniel, when he was taken off to Babylon, he was made one of the wise men in the court of the king. Uh, so most people believe that these wise men, while we don't know much about the star, we could assume that perhaps they came from Babylon, they were descendants of people who maybe had heard of Daniel, had, had read the books of the Old Testament, well, which had been taken off maybe into Babylon and, and preserved and passed on. And, and they had heard that there's going to be this, this signal, uh, this star in the sky that's going to indicate that the king of kings, the king of the Jews, the one promised for thousands of years has arrived. So I don't know what the Magi had, like this special book of things to watch for, but, but they, they love to learn. They love knowledge. Uh, and, and when they saw the star, they, they went on a journey. A journey that probably took months of time. Uh, most people believe that it, it covered perhaps up to a thousand miles. Uh, some people believe that this journey would have included hundreds of people in their caravan in order to get to this destination. It required a great deal of, uh, of time and energy and resources, and these men had them. They were probably wealthy. We can see that by the gifts that they gave later, uh, and, and because of uh, the, the, the fact that they got an appearance with the king would have would say something about who they were and what they had resources to do. But when I read this story, I, I stopped and paused this last time and wondered a question. Like these guys from the East, non-Jewish Christians, they, they heard a prophecy of a star and a king, and, and maybe just maybe the, these men who love knowledge, if, if they had strengths finders test 2,000 years ago, they had been learners uh, on the list, uh, were all about what they got to, to see and experience and, and, and have happened in their life. And, and, and let me to this question that maybe you've wrestled with before. For the wise men, was it about the journey or the destination? Like the star appears, they get their stuff together, they gather their people, they, they put their resources on the camels, and, 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 and they go. And all along the way, they maybe encounter different things and, and visit different cities and, and see different sites. They, they experience storms that they get through in the desert. They got to cover their face because the, the dust kicks up. Uh, unexpectedly out of the blue, the, the heat beats down on them, and, the, and they survived uh, all the way there to Jerusalem. Was it about the journey? Or, or was it about the destination? And I wonder that for the wise men. Because isn't that something that a lot of us deal with in our life? <laughs> Maybe this last year you've gone through a whole lot, you've experienced different things, and uh, your goal was to arrive at a destination. But when you got there, was it about the journey or was it about the destination? Uh, maybe that's true in your life. Have you ever trained for like a, a marathon? How many of you have ever run a marathon? Put your hand up really high because you, sh you should be proud of yourself. This is kind of crazy that you would put yourself through this torture, this journey of training and training and training for a, a five, uh, for a 26.2 mile run, five plus hours for some people. And here's the crazy thing, like you pay to do this, is that right? Like you give somebody money so that you can put yourself through that journey, all to cross a finish line and get a medal. Is it about the journey, the experience, or that finish line destination? Maybe in your life you've experienced something like my daughter did just a few weeks ago. A lot of people ask this question, is it about the journey 
or the destination when it comes to school. Uh, she went to college, she changed majors, she changed schools along the way. Four and a half years later, after student teaching experiences, you know what she did? She walked across the stage, she received a diploma from the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh with thousands of other people. Like as my daughter is crossing the stage and, and we're yelling and screaming, most of the people around us could care less that she reached the destination. And if you asked her, she probably would say it, it's been more about the journey, about what she's learned along the way, the, the tough choices she had to make, the, the experiences that were a part of it, how, how in the process of, of all those things she got to that point, it was the journey and the destination was kind of like, nice. Now, thankfully, God gives us the answer for the wise men. But I want you to wrestle with this question. When it, when it comes to life, and, and maybe even apply it spiritually, is it about the journey in your mind or the destination? As a Christian, are you consumed with, with the journey, and do you forget about the destination? And one has to wonder what it was for the wise men originally, but thankfully the story tells us the answer. That's where our classic Christmas wise men version continues with verse 3. When King Herod... So Herod was the king at that time. Heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. So here's the thing. The king of the Jews, who wasn't a Jew, his name was Herod. He was from Edom, actually. When he hears the news that the king of the Jews had arrived, he was disturbed. And one might think, why? <laughs> like, don't you think the, the king of the Jews and the people of Jerusalem would have been waiting for this guy, would have been looking forward to this king? Yes, but King Herod wasn't. King Herod was, was nothing about the destination, but about the journey. His life journey for more power, for more wealth, for more lands, for more fame, for more mansions. Like, like Herod was renowned for building mansion after mansion and palace after palace all over the country. It was all about Herod. And here's the thing that disturbed Herod. The king of kings, lord of lords, prophesied person that these wise men identified as having arrived. And all Jerusalem was disturbed as well. They didn't get up and run to Bethlehem and go, we got to see this thing like the shepherds did. No, they, they froze and they shook in their boots. You know why? Because they knew if Herod was disturbed, their life journey was going to be disturbed. Herod was ruthless. He was a killer. He was all about protecting himself. He, he, he murdered his own family members for his own skin and for his own rule. And they knew what Herod would probably do if he got his hands on the king of kings and lord of lords. They were disturbed that Herod was disturbed. And so Herod calls together all the people's chief priests. Those are the spiritual leaders, right? The teachers of the law, the experts in the Old Testament. These are God's wise men, so to speak. They're the Old Testament knowledgeable people. And here's what they said about the Messiah. He was to be born in Bethlehem in Judea. For, what is written, uh, for this is what was written by the prophet. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Micah prophesied and said, Bethlehem's the place. So then Herod called the Magi secretly, so he had a secret conversation with them and told them uh, these details and then found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child as soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. Now Herod's motives were different than the wise men. Herod's motives we're to, to get rid of this king. We know that later because Herod went through the city of Bethlehem and, and murdered every child under the age of two in order to try and get rid of Jesus. Now, that's why we, we know Jesus' age must have been somewhere between that two and under time frame when the star first appeared. That's why he identified that. And as you're hearing all that, do you wonder what's going on in the heart of the wise men? Do you wonder if they had a spiritual wrestling match going on in their heart to, to answer this question? Thinking about the journey and getting to the destination, do you think they posed the classic question of, is the journey worth it? Like, we spent resources to get here, and, and the king, the most powerful man in this nation, has no clue that there was a star are we seeing things? Are we confused by things? Is there, is there something off? Is it worth it? Do you wonder as they left, if, they, if they, they said to each other, should we just give up and go home? Like, like we've been through a lot. We've endured all this travel. We've experienced uh, so many different things. 
Maybe we should just cut our losses and, and return. Do you maybe think they wondered this whole star thing that, that people predicted? Maybe it isn't really true. Maybe there isn't a, a higher power God, ruler of the universe, who made the stars, who rules over all things, who, who was going to send his son. Maybe it's all made up and it's not worth the journey, spiritually speaking. I'm going to cash in my chips and give up on God. We can relate, can't we? As we end a year and begin another one, maybe you're looking at life and the things going on in your world and you're wondering, is the journey worth it? Maybe you're experiencing financial difficulties or relationship problems and you're wondering, will I get through this journey? Is it, is it worth it? Maybe you're wrestling with spiritual things when it comes to, to God and his word and, and wondering if the sacrifices you're making, the, the, the way that, that, that God calls you to live is worth it. Maybe you're thinking you'd rather just kick it all to the side and, and give up. One has to wonder if that went through the hearts of the, the wise men. And that's why I'm thankful that year after year we're reminded of the wise men <laughs> and a classic truth that, that comes from their response to those questions. <laughs> is it about the destination or the journey? And, and is the journey worth it when it comes to spiritual matters, especially this timeless Christmas account of the wise men. I'll look at what happens next. After they had heard the king, they went on their way and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. I don't know how the star operated before this time, but from this point forward, God actually takes the star and he uses it as a beacon in the night. He, he allows it to guide them. Literally, it moves along and, and stops over the place where, where Jesus was. Maybe they wondered, will we ever get there? Will we ever find it? Well, God made sure that they would arrive at their destination. God made sure that they were going to get to see uh, the one who was there when the stars were put into the sky because of this star. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. They were so excited. And in coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary. And they bowed down and they worshiped him. And they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, of frankincense, and myrrh. Do you know what you find in those truths? Do you know what you find in the wise men? These men were powerful. These men were wealthy. These men had it all. People would come to them for knowledge. People would come to them for insight. People would come to them and acknowledge them as greater than, than they were. You know what happened in, a, in, in the instant those men walked through the door of that house? They dropped to their knees. And they worshipped. A toddler. Like, come to our early childhood room and see three-year-olds running around it. There's probably not a single one of them that you will bow down on your knees and worship. In fact, ask their teachers. <laughs> you won't want to. But that's what they did because they knew who that toddler was. They knew who that child was. They, they knew that he was the king of kings, lord of lords, ruler of the universe, the only solution to their sin and their greatest need. And so they bowed down and they worshiped because they knew... That child was the one who was going to deliver them. That child was the one who was going to save them. That, that child was the one that God had promised. You, you see what you find in, in the shepherd, in the, in the wise men? A, a classic Christmas truth that is throughout Luke chapter 2 as well as Matthew chapter 2. And that truth is this. Christmas is a destination story. It, it starts with Luke chapter 2 verse 1 in a census that got Mary and Joseph to their destination where the baby was to be born because that fulfilled prophecy, Bethlehem, like we read from Micah chapter 5. It was a destination story for the shepherds who, who heard about it and then ran a 5K to, to Bethlehem in the manger. And out of breath, they, they celebrated and they worshipped the King of kings and Lord of lords. They got to their destination and God made sure of it. And for the wise men, the arrival of a king was a destination. See, here's what I don't think the wise men did when they got back to the east after they returned. I don't think they sat and talked about the, the, the storms they encountered in the desert. I don't think they, they stopped about how long it took them to get there and, and told of all the harrowing things that happened. No, I think they told every last person they could find that they saw the king, the, the one, the promised savior, the, the one that they needed and others needed. Yes, God has fulfilled every promise. And Christmas is a destination story, not just for the wise men and the shepherds and Mary and Joseph. It's a destination story for you and for me. 
Because Jesus left his throne of heaven and came to earth and made this his destination. And Jesus grew up to be a a man who was perfect and without sin. But he had another destination that, that he had to go to called Golgotha, called the cross. Where he endured another destination, one that we deserve, the very pains of hell, separation from God. But on Easter Sunday, he rose. <laughs> he, he, he rose from the tomb and, and then 40 days later returned to his, his home in heaven so that you and I might, might know that we have a destination for, for our future <laughs> that is secure and certain. At Christmas, Jesus making earth his destination is a destination story for you and for me so that just like the wise men, we can find peace and joy and hope along our journey. <laughs> It's why I pray that you can celebrate this, this last truth. Because <laughs> this is what the wise men experienced. The journey was worth it. Because they got to see Jesus. And I don't know what 2019 will bring you, and I don't know what 2018 will bring, has brought you, but, but I want you to know something, that, that there will come a time and there will be a day when you breathe your last, and, and I want you to know that whatever journey, uh, your, your life journey brings you, it is worth it going through it. Don't give up on God. Don't run the other direction. Don't, don't give, give up hope. Because God is in store for you an amazing truth that you will get to see Jesus. Just like the wise men, he's, he's not going to use a star to get you there, but he uses the light, the light of his word and the light of life, which is Jesus. And he wants you to see Jesus. And you know when you breathe your last and, and you join God in heaven, you know what you're going to do? You're, you're not going to bring gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh because because God doesn't need those things in heaven. But you know what you're going to do just like the wise men? You're going to get down on your knees. And you're going to get to worship the one who made the stars, the one who was identified by a star, the, the one who is the light. And because he's the light in heaven, we need no sun, no star. And God wants you to know that getting to see Jesus is worth the journey. And that's important going into a new year. Because here's what I can't tell you as a pastor. I can't tell you where it's going to take you. I can't tell you what's in store for your March or your June or your August. I can't tell you you're going to get a new job or if you're going to lose yours. I can't tell you if you're going to get bad news from a doctor about a disease called cancer. So I know that there's a journey in store for each and every one of us, and, and God wants all of us to have the assurance of, of this reality that whatever the journey brings us, it's worth it. Because seeing Jesus will be the greatest thing that, that you and I will ever have happen in our life when, when God calls us to be with him in heaven. And until then, he wants us to know that on the journey, that he's with us, that he'll guide us, that he'll lead us there. It's why I love the words of the Apostle Paul. See, he knew this about the Christmas truth, that Christmas is a destination story, about Jesus' destination, earth, so that you and I may be destination heaven. And that's why he said our citizenship is in heaven. And we're not residents here. Jesus came here so that we might be residents of heaven for eternity. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, he'll transform our lowly bodies so that they'll be like his glorious body. When we worship him, he won't be toddler Jesus. He'll be almighty, all-powerful, ruler of the universe, Jesus. And just like Paul, we can say we eagerly await our Savior from there. But until he comes for, for us or returns in all his glory, I, I pray that this last classic Christmas timeless truth resonates with your heart as you go forward. That, that seeing Jesus, that meeting Jesus face to face, no matter what comes up this year in your life or beyond, so worth the journey. Because just like the wise men, when you see him, the worship and experience will be eternity changing. I, I pray that until then, God strengthens us in our faith and blesses us as we celebrate that Christmas is a destination story for you and for me and for all because of Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, your promises. And Jesus, we thank you that you made destination earth a reality, that you went to the destination of the cross and endured the pain and suffering of hell 
so that our ultimate destination because of your death and resurrection might be heaven. And we know along the way, O oh Lord, the journey will be tough. We'll, we'll be in the position like the wise men to wonder if the journey's worth it. Strengthen us in our faith when, when those questions arise so that we can know and, and see and one day experience exactly what they did, being in the presence of the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, our Savior. Until then, O oh Lord, strengthen our faith in all that we face until that day when we join you at your side. Amen. At this time, we